Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. In this series of teaching videos we're studying together in the first epistle of John in our last study together, we just gotten to verse 12 of chapter 2. I am writing unto you, little ones, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. And here's a direct indicative statement by the Holy Spirit. I write unto you little ones, and I believe the expression little ones is the, is the aged uh, Apostle John being led by the Holy Spirit to say, you precious little ones, uh, you precious members of the body of Christ. He's writing to every single member of the body of Christ when he says, little children. Your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake, and it's not something that we just want to gloss over real quick. I write unto you because your sins are forgiven. The forgiven there is exactly the same word that's, that's in 1 John 1, 9. Uh, in 1 John 1, 9, the forgiven is an aorist tense. If we confess our sins, uh, and it sounds like God's going to forgive them, but the, if we confess those sins, but the aorist tense says that they're already forgiven. When you confess, that is, you say the same thing that God says about your sin, which is what the word confess means, you know you're, that they're forgiven by the blood of the cross. You're presented holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. It's either true or it isn't. If we look at uh, the verse, I'm writing unto you little ones, and, and uh, little children, little ones. Uh, I just, I see an immense love. A tremendous love by the, uh, in that expression that your sins are forgiven. Now, that seems to be so common on the surface. It seems, well, what Christian doesn't know that his sins are forgiven? And I, I would venture to say that Many don't, and that's just my point. Many don't. And when you confess, that is, you say the same thing that God says about your sin. Well, what has God said about our, your sin? Well, one of the things he said is that they've been forgiven. They've been cast as far as the east is from the west, buried in the depths of the sea, uh, sought for, not found, remembered no more. Uh and so the first thing that's inferred in the verse is that you have sin, okay? And we've been vacillating back and forth for a few verses in John. And I've tried to warn you that we're looking at a conflict uh, between the flesh and the spirit here. We're looking at verses as though uh, 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 there is indeed, uh, in fact, sin in our lives. As Christians, there is sin in, in our lives. Uh, and, and of course, uh, I, I think to a great extent, many Christians uh, read these verses as if there shouldn't be sin in, in their life, if you follow what I'm saying. So, uh, I believe we're looking at, you know, I mean, the context here is not, you know, we're, we're looking at two different individuals, one is a believer and one is not. These are, these are believers, they're brethren, and I believe we're looking at the conflict between the flesh and the spirit. I've pointed that out in previous videos. Uh, he that says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loves his brother abides in the light. There's no occasion of stumbling in him, and I talked a little bit about that word stumble in uh, a previous video. And so many think there's two classes of people. You know, there are these sinners, and then there's us people who don't sin at all or shouldn't sin at all. And uh, I believe that this, uh, uh, in fact, I think I mentioned in several studies ago that this has led many a serious uh, minister of the word into uh, theological trouble. I know uh, 
Uh, I know a minister who loves the Lord, uh, one who's really serious in his ministry. He's dedicated his life to serving. He becomes greatly concerned and he says, you know, how can a person say that he loves Christ and, and believe that he's going to heaven and, and, and just live like hell? You know, and so they write books. Uh, many books have been written. Uh, the shelves are just full of them. They, they come up with, with the horror of a thing like easy believism. All you have to do is believe and you got it made and they all miss the point. Dearly beloved, you are not redeemed because you believed. You're not holy and unblameable and unreprovable because you did anything. That is the great horror of modern Christianity. That's why so many Christians don't have any peace and they don't have any rest. They don't have any joy because they believe that they are to live an implicitly holy and absolutely righteous life so that there can't be any sin. Oh, dearly beloved, I write unto you because you do sin and your sins are forgiven. If we say that, that we don't, we have no sin, the truth's not in us. I write unto you because your sins are forgiven. It's a perfect tense. And theologians wrestle over that. Theologians say, well, what that perfect means is it, it, it means that the minute you confess Christ, the minute that you repent and accept Christ as your Savior, the minute that you accept Him, then your sins are forgiven. And this perfect tense, folks, looks back to that moment, okay, of Christ dying in our place. It looks back to the sacrifice of Christ by the blood of the cross where your sins have been forgiven. That is where your sins were forgiven, not when you asked God to or did anything to be forgiven. That is what the text is saying, not just here, but in other places all around the New Testament as well. Now, that's, that's a hard thing for many Christians to wrap their minds around. But folks, all of the sins that you were going to commit were committed after, or, or let me just put it this way, Christ died on the cross and forgave you, you, of all your sins before you ever committed any. That's what this book teaches. But we don't tend to want to look at that. And there's a reason for that. And that's because we want to elevate man to that position of God and play God in our lives. And, and, uh, and we want to make it all conditional. We've got to, to say that we have to do something in order for God to do something. And that's what not, that's not what the text says. And, and folks, you are surrounded by a religious system where that it's all left up to you. Okay. If you don't confess, if you don't believe, if you don't recognize that you're a sinner, you know, if you don't recognize that you're going to hell and, 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 and confess those sins and accept Christ as your personal Savior, then you will not be forgiven. And that is not what the book says. When by the blood of his cross, you, you were, it was through the blood of his cross that you were presented holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. Not because you accepted, not because you believed, but because God loved you before the foundation of the world. Now, he forgave us because we are his child. And, and people get mad at me and they say, you know, well, Steve, the scriptures say that you must be born again. Well, it sure does. It absolutely does. And what did he, Christ tell Nicodemus to do to be born again? Nothing. The must there is the must of necessity. You must be born again. He's not telling Nicodemus that he had, he wasn't telling Nicodemus he had to do anything to be born again. He was simply stating a fact, you must be born again. But we read that and we go, well, we must, Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. So therefore there must be something Nicodemus must do to be born again. And that is not what the text teaches. Folks, now I know that is, that might be difficult for you to wrap your mind around. I've done videos on, on that subject, uh, many of them, in fact, in the past. But I just want to put this out here again. I want to continue to, to tell you what the text is so that you can make up your mind as to what this text is really saying. What did he say? 
He said, you don't know where that it came from. You don't know where it's going. Such is everyone born of the Spirit. That's the answer. It isn't something that, and it's not something that Christ is revealing that is new. That, that was the third chapter of John. In the first chapter of John, we read, as, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. See, you got to receive him. And that's not what the text says at all. It says, many, as many as received him. Who will receive him? Those who were born again by the will of God. Folks, we've got to stop elevating man and suppressing Christ. Uh, a large part of this ministry is based upon the truthful concept of that, that God works in us in, in a way, the process in which he works in our lives. Right, right from the very beginning, if you, want to, if you want to begin that whole process at our new birth, which I don't believe we should, I think we should take and look at the beginning of the entire process as being one which began long before the world's world was ever created. The foundation of the world was ever laid. So, uh, who were born not by the will of the flesh, nor by the will of man, nor by blood, but by the will of God. Same author as human author as we're we're reading here. We know that God's the Holy God, the Holy Spirit is the author, but it's John writing, and the same John wrote those words: "Born again by the will of God." such as everyone who is born of the Spirit. and But somehow we can't believe that. We say that we understand grace, but we don't. Little children, I don't care what you've done, okay? And I don't care what you're doing. Your sins were forgiven when Jesus Christ died in your place, and it's a perfect tense. They not only were completely forgiven, okay? They stand forgiven i talk to christians all the time who are carrying a burden of what they think is unforgiven sin you just can't be you can't live this way you can't do these things and minister after minister will tell me steve you can't preach that way because your people will go out and just live you know like the devil live live in sin and i say they're already doing that i don't have to tell them to do that If you do not love the Lord, and if you don't care about the way you live, I think you're walking in darkness. And how we as Christians walk is a matter that is directly related to the spirit-flesh conflict that we saw in Romans chapter 7. Listen, little children, I'm writing unto you not to tell you how to live, not to warn you about this or that. I'm writing to you to tell you that your sins have been forgiven because of his namesake. Okay? That takes it completely out of the realm of human works. Uh, we look at Luke 24, uh, 24th chapter, verse 47. Uh, Repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among the nations. Okay, John chapter 20, same, same writer, John, these things have I written unto you that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Okay, but what, what did he write? Well, John chapter 10, why don't you believe me? Because you're not my sheep. My sheep believe me. So my problem is not trying to make you want to be uh, a sheep okay if you're one of his sheep you're going to believe if you're not you're not and and that's where we have so many ministers confused today about christians not living like christians what does it mean his name's sake okay well you could go into a bank and you could say well in the name of, of stephen sewell i want this million dollar check cashed and what you know the bank could laugh at you And people handle the, the name of Jesus Christ a lot that way. Because of his name's sake, he, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died in your place 
is the creator of heaven and earth. He's the Lord God Jehovah. He's the one who declared what is righteous and what isn't righteous. And he is absolutely righteous. And he declared that you needed a kinsman redeemer, and he became that kinsman redeemer. You didn't ask him to. You did not ask him to. You didn't say, I'm hopeless and helpless, and I confess my sins, and, and if I do, you know, if, 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 uh, you know, if you'll only forgive me, I'll, I'll do this, that, or the other thing. Now look, the creator of heaven and earth. Jehovah God, the almighty, sovereign majesty of eternity, became incarnate as your kinsman. You're a member of his family. You know, the, the word world in John 3.16, and I did a video, uh, you can go back and try to find it. It's, it was a video I did on John 3.16. The word world there does not mean everybody that ever lived. Okay. We love him because he first loved us. Therefore, if the word world in John 3.16 means everybody that ever lived, we got a problem. Because if, if it means everybody that ever lived and he loved everybody that ever lived, then they would, they would have to all love him. Dearly beloved, listen to me. Because the scriptures declare the reason we love him is because he first loved us. We are members of his family. There's another family. Okay? The good seed or the sons of the kingdom. The tear, the sons of the devil. I didn't say that. Okay? God did. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty, spoke to the Pharisees and said, Ye are of your father the devil, and his deeds ye will do. And Christians, by the score, are unwilling to admit that there are two families. I declare unto you, little children, that because of his namesake, because of his namesake, you're in the family and the household of God, and your sins are forgiven. Now, I'm not going to tell you that you may not pay the, the cost of some stupid mistake that you make in life, some stupid physical mistake, but you stand before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. That is true of you if you were born again yesterday or if you've been in the Lord for 60, 70 years. The same is true. And we're going to look at that. We're going to see that in this, in these uh, first, these uh, two or three verses that we're, we're looking at here. You stand before God, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. In Colossians chapter 1, you'll remember 14th verse, in whom we have redemption by means of your acceptance. No. In whom we have redemption by means of your faith, your belief, your what, whatever. No. In whom we have redemption by means of his blood. Okay? Even the forgiveness of sins. It isn't by anything we did. Look at what he said. We're strengthened with, with, with all might according to his glorious power. Not because we decided to be strong. Okay? It is, in fact, it's when we're weak that we're strong because we're trusting in him, not ourselves. Our confidence is in Christ, not ourselves. You say, well, I, I don't do that. You do as a new creation in Christ. Imagine you're doing something that you don't even know you're doing, but, you, but you're giving thanks unto the Father who's made us fit, made us fit to be partakers. Of, I think the, the King James says made, made us meet. It's made us fit to be partakers of the, or sharers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Okay? But what are you going to do? Are, are you going to, you're going to tell me at one time you were fit, okay? You were qualified. Uh, and now... For some strange reason, uh, you're not. And, and somehow, and you messed all that up. You messed that up. Let me tell you, there are millions of Christians that don't believe that he delivered us from the power of darkness. Okay? Did he or didn't he translate us into the kingdom of his dear son? You say, well, he, he's going to do that, Steve. He's going to do that after he sees how well, you know, I live. 
And, you know, and, and if at the end of my life, you know, he feels like I've made it, then he'll translate me into the kingdom. of. Look, it doesn't say that. What happened when Jesus Christ died in your place? What happened? You were strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. How? Where, where does that strength come from? It comes from this book, folks, right here. Okay? That's where the strength comes from. You've been, you've been made fit to be a partaker, a sharer of the inheritance of the saints. You've been delivered from the power of darkness. Okay? So live like it. Live like it. First chapter of Ephesians. According as he has chosen to send him before the foundation of the wor world, in order that we be holy without blame before him in love. Well, did he do that? Folks, I'm asking, did he do that? Did he do that? Or do you just wish he'd do that? You know, you're hoping that he'd do that. I mean, are we going to stand up and preach that he chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world if you do something? It doesn't say that. And folks, you are very, very precious to God. He chose you that you would be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, you may not look like that, and you may not act like that, but you are my little children. My little children, I'm writing unto you because your sins have been forgiven, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by means of Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Not according to the good pleasure of your will, okay? To the praise of the glory of His grace wherein He has made us accepted in the Beloved. Same thing we had in Colossians chapter 1. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin. And folks, the text says that that was all according to the riches of His grace, okay? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Read on. Being justified freely by His grace. Freely. That's without a cause. Okay? And modern Christianity says you're justified by His grace because there's a cause. You are justified without a cause. That's grace. Acts chapter 13. The... the, the 13, Acts chapter 13, the 48th verse. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And back up to verse 39. And by him, by him, okay, all that believe are made righteous, are, are justified. Who are the ones who believe? Who are the ones who believe? Those who are ordained to believe. It's exactly what we have in John chapter 10. Okay? Why don't you believe me? Because you're not my sheep. If you're my sheep, you believe. And somehow, we've turned that all around. You know, and if you want to be a sheep today, nowadays, if you want to be a sheep, you got to believe. And, the, and folks, that pushes man up and pushes the God down. These most sacred, cherished truths are not guarded by or loved by modern Christianity. Okay. This, you know, the saying is, the old saying is true. Tell people a lie long enough and it becomes the truth. I think we're, you can't even look, turn on the news nowadays and not see that, that look at what's taking place in the world, the, the non-religious world. It's, it's so true. But the same church, th the same thing is, is true when it comes to the things that we're talking about here. I've, I've, I've explained before how that, you know, if, we, if you were born four, 400 some odd years ago, uh, everything I'd be telling you would be mainstream Christianity, okay? You may not want to believe that, but that's the truth. Little children, my dearly beloved, your sins are forgiven. They were forgiven because the God of eternity became your kinsman redeemer. He died in your place. Okay? You never asked him to do it. He did it. The Holy Spirit says to Timothy, 
Take heed to doctrine, for in so doing you'll save thyself and them that hear thee. Notice he says you'll save yourself. That's, that's deliver. It's not redeem. It's deliver. Does that verse say Timothy isn't redeemed? I mean, now, nobody would suggest that. But, well, I, I, I shouldn't say that. I, I say nobody, nobody would suggest that. Well, of course, people suggest that all the time. But that's not true. And I've often talked about how that saved does not mean redeemed. Perfect tense. I'm writing unto you little children because that is all inclusive. The entire body of Christ. Little children. This is what, what he calls us. Okay. I'm writing unto you little children because your sins have been completely forgiven in past time with the result that they stand today completely forgiven. Acts chapter 13. Through his name, through or through this name, the text says, will be preached forgiveness of sins. Okay? I don't hear that. What, what I hear is, if you do something, then your sins would be forgiven. We are justified freely, made righteous freely by His grace. Now here is a dogmatic statement of grammar, if, if that grammar means anything to you. If that doesn't mean anything to you, don't read this book. Okay, if words don't mean anything, all right, you're wasting your time studying this book. The, the Christianity that I normally run into, okay, uh, people believe the strangest things that... that that they could no way support biblically. And when you ask them to support it biblically, they, they get a little, little, little mad at you. If you don't see Jesus Christ on every page of this book, you're missing the message of this book. This book is not an instruction book on how to live the Christian life. It is primarily a revelation of the person and the work of Christ. And if you don't see that, you're missing seeing Christ. Okay. Uh, if folks, if I can't support what I'm saying by this book, please unsubscribe. Stop watching Blessed Hope Forever. I want you to look carefully at what this book says and, and say, Steve, you know, you're wrong about that. And what I think it says is, is this. So, okay. And I'd love to discuss it with you. My Bible says, your sins have been forgiven in past time, and I am stressing the present reality of that completed action. Okay? That's the perfect tense. Your sins are forgiven. And clearly, the 12th verse opens up our minds to what the, the ninth verse said in, first, in the first chapter. If we say the same thing that God says, well, what does God say about our sin? He says, your sins are forgiven. I ask Christians, what does it mean to be, you know, justified, made righteous freely without a cause? Okay, what, what is it? Uh, what does it mean to be justified freely by his grace? Well, it means that you, ex you recognize you're a sinner and you accepted Christ as your Savior. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say that. We were justified, made righteous, freely without a cause. You're not justified because you did anything. Your sins aren't forgiven because you did anything. Through the name of Jesus Christ will be proclaimed forgiveness of sin. That the sins have already been forgiven. Not that they will be if you do something. Okay? The apostles preached, believe that your sins are forgiven. That's what they preached. You won't hear that preached today. What you hear preached today is if you do something, your sins will be forgiven. The apostles did not preach that. The apostles of Jesus Christ did not preach that. They, they, they preached, believe that your sins are forgiven. Why? why how could they just do that? Because uh, God's people's, uh, the sins of God's people are forgiven. Not if you believe your sins will be forgiven. And there is a world of difference. That's how much the modern church has adulterated the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your sins are not forgiven because of anything you did or who you are. And likewise, in the same way, you've been born from above. You're not born from, from above by your own will, your own strength, your own anything. 
Okay? You were born again by the will of God. Period. Period. No, you weren't born uh, from above by your will, the will of the flesh, the will of man, but by the will of God and what God accomplished in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ was, was your redemption totally separate from you. And yet modern Christianity, on the other hand, says God did everything he could do. You know, oh, poor God, he, he just wasn't able to do anymore. The rest is up to you. And that's the way the modern church has gone. You know, it's now you who decides your destiny, not a loving Heavenly Father who knew you before the foundation of the world, who planted you, okay, as who you are. Listen, little children, your sins are forgiven. Simply put, grace is what modern Christianity rebels against. Why? 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 Because they want the power of the flesh. They want to say, I did it. You can't do anything to affect your redemption. I will go to meet, to, to meet the Lord. Whether I live or die, raptured or not, I will, to my last breath, I will preach that you cannot do anything whatsoever to affect your redemption because that's not what this book teaches. I don't care how popular the message is. That's not what the text is saying. One of the marvelous truths of, of this book is that you are his little children. You're not his little children because you elected to be his little children, because you decided you wanted to be God's, God's little child. From before the foundation of the world, you were his child, and he's, and he's working in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. Oh, little children, your sins are forgiven you. And that is irregardless of the fact that you're in the midst of that Romans 7 conflict. Though you don't always walk in the light. Though you don't always love your brother. Though you don't... Oh, Steve, I, I never hate my brother. Stop. Okay? The flesh does just that. So he's forgiven us. Irregardless of the fact that... that that, that there's this conflict going on. Irregardless of the fact that, that you don't pay your taxes or, or you don't go to the mission field or you don't mow the grass around your church. you know. So why do we want to do that stuff then? Why do we want to do it? Well, because God so loves us. That's why we do it. And he's so forgiven us. God determined, folks, that you would be his before time. Okay? All right. Before time began. We sinned in time. In this thing that we call time. God planned your redemption in timelessness before he created this thing that we call time wherein we sinned. There were sins committed before the cross and sins committed after the cross. Your sins are forgiven. Okay? And sin should never Never, ever, 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 ever be a question in your life. Okay? Little children, your sins are forgiven you. We've died to sin. Now, folks, I'm not trying to make light of sin. I'm simply confessing, saying the same thing God said about our sin. I mean, sin costs the death of Jesus Christ in your place. The trouble is modern Christianity is so concerned about the horror of sin that they're unwilling to accept the wonder of God's grace. Modern ministers are greatly concerned about 1 John. They'd like to ignore this book because it, it seems to vacillate between darkness and light, lying and truth, uh, confessing, not confessing, you know, so they see a believer and a non-believer here. Because surely a Christian wouldn't walk in darkness, and surely a Christian wouldn't hate his brother. I strongly suggest that the context is speaking of the conflict between the spirit and the flesh in God's children, who have been forgiven all their sins. Okay? There's the clear undercurrent throughout this entire epistle of that ceaseless conflict between flesh and spirit, so that you almost cry out, at times, who shall deliver me from this body of sin and death? 
And then you realize what the Holy Spirit was saying in Romans chapter 7. Our deliverance from this body of death is through Jesus Christ our Lord. Little children, your sins are forgiven. I, for those of you out there who think I'm really pushing this to, okay, Steve, I, I get it. Move on, okay? Bear with me, all right? If we don't, if we can't nail that down from the very start, okay, folks, we're not going to make much progress in, in our lives as a Christian. Your sins have been perfectly forgiven in time past, apart from anything you did, with the results of that being that you stand today fully, completely, perfectly forgiven. That's what the text says. Are you living that way? Are you living that way? Are you walking with the Lord day by day with that truth at the center of your heart and your relationship with Him? That would be my question. Well, uh, okay, our deliverance from this body of death, uh, okay, it's through Jesus Christ our Lord, your sins are forgiven, but what about the ones I commit tomorrow? Doesn't matter. They're forgiven. Next week, the ones I commit next week, forgiven. Well, what about the ones, you know, a, a year from now, forgiven. And now he divides his little children into two groups. Okay? Two groups. I am writing unto you fathers... Older people, okay, these are not probably just men. They're the, you know, the older people of God's body, men and women both. I write unto you older ones because you have known him that is from the beginning. Well, he must must be speaking to us here, right? I can't, I mean, you know, I've got to be speaking to us. I'm more and more persuaded on that I'm slowly beginning to pastor a geriatric church. Now, I don't. Please, I don't mean that as, as, as any insult. Uh, we're all growing older. I mean, there are some younger people here, but not many. The word have known, first of all, is our word gnosko, experiential knowledge, the Greek word for intimate knowledge, and it's a perfect passive voice, perfect tense, passive voice. Your sins are forgiven. That's a perfect passive. You didn't forgive them. God did. Now he goes on to say, you older folks, because you have known him that is from the beginning, and have known is a perfect active, which means that it was completely done in past time. The Holy Spirit is, is pressing, is emphasizing the present reality of that past completed action. Then he goes on and he says, I'm writing unto you young folks, okay, and, and I have another perfect active, perfect tense, stresses the present reality of a past completed action. In this case, the active voice indicates you did it. I'm writing unto you young folk because you have overcome the wicked one. Okay, have you? Have you? If you say you haven't, then this verse is a lie. And I would be, I'm willing to, to, to suggest that most of the churches that, that today, if you walked in into that church and you stood up and you said, I want all of you young folks in this congregation to know, I want every one of you, without exception, every single last one of you young people, I want, I want you to know that you have overcome the wicked one. They'd probably escort you out of the building. They'd probably escort you out of the, out of the, out of the auditorium. I, 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 would, I would guess that that's probably what would happen. And yet you would be speaking the truth. Think about it, folks. Have overcome the wicked one. I mean, have you? Have you overcome the wicked one? Oh, no, I haven't overcome the wicked one. The text says you have. Every one of you in Christ. Okay? But what Christianity says is, modern Christianity says, you've got to overcome. Okay? You better overcome. You have to do it. What the verse says is you have overcome the evil. That's articulated, the evil or the evil one, okay? Which would be Satan, the devil. You've overcome. 
I hope with all my heart that you rest in the greatness of the grace and the love of God who bought you despite all the mess that might be your life. Oh, I have grand news for you. You have completely overcome the evil. Okay? Modern Christianity thinks it's something that you got to do, and the text clearly infers that you did it. Okay? That's what the text says. Hard to believe, isn't it? Amazing, isn't it, folks, that, that you don't hear that when you walk into churches today? But it's true. The text does not lie. Okay? And I'm trying to drive you into a greater interest in studying this book so that you can see for yourself that what I'm telling you is the truth. We are strong. Folks, in, 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 the, in the middle of, of what you would believe would be your greatest weakness, okay? You're strong. Why is it? Why, how could you be? How could you be strong? Because your strength is in Jesus Christ our Lord, okay? Ye have overcome the evil one. I, now, I'm going to suggest that, that if we don't understand verse 12, that our sins have been forgiven, which I so emphatically stressed here in this video, if we don't understand that, if we don't believe that, then we can't understand verses 13 and 14. I'm seeing little children here as all-inclusive, composed of, of two groups, both old and young, to emphasize the fact, folks, that what is said here is true regardless of physical age or level of maturity. That's how gracious our God is. Our God is a God of grace and a God of love. He won't desert you. He will not cease to sustain and uphold you. He's working in your life constantly, moment by moment, without a break. Okay? He's working in your life to will and do His good pleasure. And as we approach the Christmas season, may the wonder of these truths of God's grace grip your hearts and direct you further into the study of His Word. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for Your Word. We're thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that we've had to look at it. Oh, Father, may its truth grip our hearts. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Thank you all for your continued interest. Thank you for all your prayers, for my health, for the direction of this ministry. Pray for one another. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.